Welcome everyone, my name is Ben Eady and I'm the online media manager of ModernAnalyst.com, the premier online community for business analysts. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar titled 10 Key Business Analyst Trends for 2012. Today's featured speaker is Gren Brule of ESI International. The webinar will last approximately 60 minutes including the Q&A session, so make sure to submit your questions in advance using the questions feature on the webinar software. I'd also like to say thank you to ESI International for sponsoring this event, and at this time, I'll turn it over to Glenn to get us started. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, good welcome, good day to uh, all of you who have joined us today. It looks like we've got about 298, 99 folks here, Ben, today, yep. which is, uh, is absolutely wonderful. Um, certainly appreciate it, and thanks so much to Modern Analyst uh, Adrian and Ben uh, for supporting this event. This is... Uh, I think my fourth year I've done the uh, uh, business analysis trends, and I, I got to admit it's uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's always fun to sort of pontificate on what's going on based on uh, some of the experiences that occur to me over the over the year, um, and sort of reflect on what's happened and what I think may uh, end up happening as well. And I think before I go on, I see a lot of questions starting to scroll through, um, and I will address a lot of these uh, questions. In fact, uh, Vinit, um, one of the questions that you asked, will address as we go along. Presentation, so stay tuned. Uh, slides will be available afterwards as well. So, without further ado, I'd like to share with you uh, 10 key business analysis trends for 2012. And you'll notice the subline is coming to an organization near you: uh, business analysis in 3D. And I think this is um, really cool. And one of the reasons I chose the, the title "business analysis in 3D" is, well, quite frankly, everything else is in 3D, and it seems really cool. Uh, but no, not really. Uh, I think one of the things that business, as business analysts um, we have to be conscientious of is that we continue to maintain our perspective on organizations <laughs> and on requirements in sort of a three-dimensional format. And this actually bleeds over into one of the trends that I'm going to talk about a little bit later on. So I'll bring up the notion of 3D requirements um, a little bit down the road. So without uh, further ado, oh, before we go on, I'll also share with you um, that as we go on, we're going to be uh, trolling for answers. So there will be plenty of opportunity for you to uh, voice your opinion um, and have a say in the, in the uh, webinar. So I'm looking forward to hearing uh, some of your responses to some of the questions we've loaded in in the form of polls. Also, I will do my best uh, to answer questions as they go on the fly. Um, there, there are an awful lot of you and one of me, so if your answer scrolls through and I miss it inadvertently, I do apologize in advance. I promise I will do my best to try and get to uh, everybody's questions. So here we go, uh, 10 key trends, and I've got the cheesy uh, animation going on here with the, uh, with the pool cue balls, and here we go. First trend, uh, organizational efficiency, and the trend reads like this. The demand for an in-depth study of business architecture, business rules, and business processes for the sake of operating with optimal efficiencies and leaner practices is putting the business analyst in the spotlight for 2012. Wow, that was an awful lot. And I can tell you, um, really what I mean here is, is this. The focus of business analysis is increasingly focusing on the practices of business versus technology. And all over the world, we have to acknowledge and recognize that nine times out of ten solutions that uh, business analysts procure end up in the hands of our information technology friends, our IT friends. And what we're seeing and what I'm seeing out there in the big old ugly world with downsizing and shrinking and uh, uh, budgets shrinking and resources shrinking and, and organizations attempting to become more lean and more efficient. Uh, so the old, uh, aid, old adage, doing more with less, is, is really rearing its ugly head. So find a lot of organizations that we're working with now are looking inwardly and assessing and evaluating how they're conducting business and the practices of business and looking to find leaner, meaner, more efficient ways. And, and this is causing, this is asking BAs not so much to focus on specifications, the tiny details, but a huge energy and effort is being put on overhauling, assessing, and evaluating uh, business rules, business processes, and business procedures. I apologize for the fire, but it's not here. It'll go by. They're gone now. But business rules, policies, and procedures are becoming most sought after. So how can we op operate in an optimal way? The other thing I'm seeing, too, that I'll add to this uh, particular slide is we're even looking, organizations are even looking at uh, things like solution development life cycles. 
project life cycles. How do we create those to be leaner and meaner? And as you can probably guess, one of the manifestations there is, you know, the advent of Scrum and the growth of Scrum as a method and an adopted method within organizations as well. So I think all over organizations, uh, whether it's government or not, we're looking to operate at a more optimal efficiency. So that's trend number Trend number two. This is a really interesting trend, and um, it couldn't have come at a better time. Um, I've just been recently appointed to work with uh, the government team here at ESI International. I've been asked to really sniff out um, business analysis opportunities, requirements management and development opportunities. And one of the themes that we've heard over the years in state and local and federal government agencies is that you know we just don't have business analysts here. We don't talk to them as business. Analysts. And I can, I can tell you, not too long ago, we ran a survey with some of our government customers here, and, and it's true, there are no business analyst titles. Well, with the exception of one government agency um, that we are very near and dear with. And, and they do have it, and they went against the grain, and they said, we have a BA title, they are doing business analysis, they have adopted IIBA standards, they have brought in some standard tools and methods, they have a business analysis center of excellence, and that was one of two. And we, we surveyed a good 15, 20 of our customers, and only 1% of that customer base that we surveyed actually knew the term and the language and the jargon where business analysis was concerned. So if we turn to state and local government agencies, um, it's a little bit different story there. State and local government agencies um, are often plagued with, and I, I, gosh, I don't know how they do it, but they really are plagued with a lot of different things. Uh, but the biggest one of late is, is because of budget cutbacks at state and local agencies, there is a tremendous push to, to eliminate waste, waste where projects are concerned. And so one of the first places they're looking are at their requirements practices. And it's interesting to note that um, as these requirements practices are getting better, there's been increased pressure on some of the outsourced vendors that are working with state and local agencies to also get better. So you're going to see uh, some of the other trends manifest themselves out as a result of this one as well. Um, and this is an, um, an isolated situation. This isn't just the US government. It's the Canadian government. It's the Singaporean government. It's the Japanese government. It's the Indian government. It's worldwide and, and, and spread all over the world, where we're starting to see you know, a very slow proliferate, pro proliferation of the world of business analysis grow. In the, in the federal government, I'll add this, too. One of the things that we're seeing, one of the areas that we're seeing requirements management practices really starting to show signs of life is in contract management or acquisition, where we have these contracting officers who are responsible for uh, preparing requests for proposals or requests for information and doing so based on the merits of requirements that they are receiving from maybe subject matter <coughs> experts or business unit owners. And so in order for them to, A, qualify and make certain that the requirements are sound before they send them out to tender, uh, they need some sort of validation process. Then once they, uh, there is an award or even through evaluation um, of said uh, proposed vendors, some of the contracting officers we talked to are, are saying we, we have criteria and it's largely based on a dollar value, but there's huge initiatives within the uh, federal government say we're trying to evaluate this not only based on value but quality of services and quality of requirements and quality of goods procured. And so we're starting to see requirements manifest themselves hugely throughout that acquisition process as well. So I think it's going to be a slow trend. I think we could probably uh, safely say that next year um, this slide will probably be back and we can uh, hopefully pontificate that, um, today that th this will continue to grow uh, throughout government agencies around the world. Um, agile methods. Uh, I mean, I had to throw this in. If I didn't throw this in, I'd probably be scoffed and scorned at. Uh, but I got to tell you that uh, everywhere I turn, it's agile, agile, agile. And I think the biggest uh, struggle that we're we're looking at here is where does the role of the business analyst fit? While I don't have all of the answers, I could certainly uh, share with what uh, share with you what I have seen. Um, certainly, a product owner is a good opportunity. Um, although I'm certain that there are folks on the phone out there who might argue otherwise, and that's fair. I'm, I'm open to that. Um, you know, there are what we would call supporting task members that support uh, Scrum-type projects moving forward. Business analysts definitely serve a role there as well. I also see an opportunity for business analysts to serve um, in sort of an agile world 
as uh, maybe the individual or group of individuals who initiate uh, projects for evaluation through uh, an agile life cycle. So while we're creating epics or developing architectural runways, I think the business analyst um, could facilitate conversations and discussions and look at high-level requirements and begin to develop those high-level user stories with um, uh, audiences that are you know, involved in said uh, procurement of, of uh, goods and services. So I think um, that is a wonderful opportunity for BAs to, uh, to look at it. The one thing that I would advise and caution on, and I think it's a, it's a big struggle and it's a great room for debate, is let's not be so um, stringent and structured about our title so much as we are stringent and structured about uh, the discipline of capturing requirements, so the function of our role more so than our titles. I think uh, we, we debate far too much on whether or not that role should be that role and vice versa. If we can contribute to a self-organizing team, then we certainly should be there front and center contributing as much as we can. I see uh, somebody saying I'm a CSM and a CSPO. Be cautious. But I agree. And again, there's still lots of room uh, for debate over there. It's just uh, uh, these are some of the things that I see uh, going on out there in the world. Again, points for pontification and conversation. All right. We got a poll uh, here. Adrian, we poll for some answers. Here's the question. Is your organization currently practicing or thinking about putting into place agile practices and or Scrum Kanban or XP methods? Let's hear what the audience has to say. Uh, what do you think, Ben? What do you think the group is going to come out flying with. Um, I'm, I'm, Agnes I'm, is gonna... Well, you used a big word like Kanban, so let's let's go with yes. <laughs> ah, all right. Let's see. There's, everybody's coming in here, so. I've got a really interesting question, Ben, as we go through here. Satish has asked a question. He said, nowadays, uh, most of the times, employers are expecting BAs to have experience in programming and development, mm -hmm. um, expecting them to share the developer's load if required. Now, to what extent is that correct, and what is your opinion of this? Well, Satish, I think if you ask some North American business analyst colleagues, you might find them um, in violent disagreement that uh, programming may not be a requirement. I say the more knowledge and the more experience you have, the better uh, to help propel you forward. I would say the caution, however, is that business analysts um, with a rich uh, programming background are likely to uh, not be as objective, potentially. So there are pros and cons. Um, I think if you got it, great. If you don't, then uh, you probably are a little bit more objective than, say, somebody who's armed to the teeth. So How the, are we doing with the poll, well, Ben? The poll came in. Uh, we got 41% say yes. Um, a second place is 25% that we're using a hybrid and waterfall iterative. Um, after that, we have no. And last, we have we're thinking about it. So, But we're thinking about it is 14%. So it's a little more than I would have thought for just thinking about it, at least. So. Well, that's, that is definitely some positive signs. And um, Thanks, Ben, for that. I really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, for contributing. Um, I'll tell you, a, a big, I'm a big fan of a gentleman who goes by the name of Scott Ambler. And um, I would encourage you to go and visit his website at ambysoft.com. He, on a regular basis, I want to say quarterly and, and biannually, runs polls and surveys to give indication of how the uh, Scrum movement and the growth of Scrum is taking off and how, how much of a positive impact it's having on the customers that he works with. And it's yours for the taking. Uh, download his spreadsheets, download his PowerPoint presentations. Really good information, uh, really good materials and content. Uh, definitely encourage you to go have a look. So very pleased to see that um, uh, 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 with the numbers. So here we go. The hybrid role. You know, <laughs> I remember this article was published not so long ago, and I was really uh, raked over the coals for this, um, and it was raked over the coals uh, from some some business analyst purists and some from some associations, and they said, "How dare you?" And I said, "Well, you know, I don't think it's a matter of how dare me, but I think it's a matter of reality. And I think everywhere we turn, somewhere inevitably there is what I call the the, the Pumbaa. And uh, if you're familiar with the Lion King, Pumbaa is that uh, that crazy looking warthog guy, and this is." Uh, 
this is my definition of a PM and a BA working in a dual role, a Pumba. Hey Glenn, I got one quick question for you. We're getting hammered by a bunch of people asking what the URL is that you just had mentioned for. Just give me a second here. Um, Can I pound it out here, Ben? A M B Y S O F T. Ambisoft. It's either dot com or dot ca. Okay. I just uh, uh, just punched it out there. I'll send to all. Awesome. Thank you so much. And Thanks, yeah. So back to the uh, hybrid role of the PM and the BA, um, I, I think the reality of it is is that we're starting to see resources shrink. And again, I go back to the doing more with less. And the more and more uh, you know, I travel the world and work with customers, I'm starting to see, these, and it may not necessarily just be exclusively PM and BA. We saw Satish talking about uh, software development there. But prevalently, there's the project manager, the business analyst. And I'm, I'm actually OK with it for the sake of efficiencies and costs and increased profitability. But here's the caveat before everybody gets their hackles up. Um, the caveat is the smaller the project, the better. Uh, obviously, the larger the, the project, the more complex the project, the greater the risk. Um, there's, more, there's more likelihood that there's going to be more budget, more dollars that are going to be uh, allocated to afford resources. Um, but if it's the case where we're working on a very large project, very complex, uh, high level of risk, then you know having a, a single person playing both roles is, is a very dangerous thing to do. Small to medium-sized projects are, are probably a safe bet. Um, and the, even with the, cha the challenge that I have in saying that is, you know, small to medium is a very subjective term, and that hi is highly dependent on the level of risk aversion that your organization has. At the end of the day, the PMBA role I think is here to stay. I think we're going to see it. We're going to continue to see it. A lot of my friends and colleagues that I work with play that dual role. I think it's okay uh, so long as we have a, a great deal of support from our cast members, we have the work-life balance thing, and we're confident in how we can execute to these very uh, sticky situations. So be aware, it is here. I think it's here, it's here to stay. So uh, next polling question, Adrian, let's, uh, let's throw this one. Does your organization support dual roles of project managers and business analysts? What do you think, Ben? Um, you know, this one, I would almost say it would be a 50-50 because I've, I've worked in a few organizations where, you know, the analysts are, are kind of put in a little cubby hole in the back and ignored and other ones where they're like, you know, right at the top with the president. So, you know, it, I, I honestly think it would be a 50-50 split. My gut says 50-50, but I actually, I, I'm going to guess that it's going to be a 60-40 split. I think it's going to surprise us. And uh, when the poll came in here, you nailed it, 59 to 41%. So 59 for yes. 59% for yes. You've been doing and this I, more I than thought... once. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I think it's okay. And I, I would and I would caution, you know, those folks that are out there who, uh, the, 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 what did you say, 59% or whatever the percentage was yes, that are that dual role, take plenty of vacations. You deserve it. It's a tough role. Um, so, and, and, and you can tell your boss I said that. Just don't tell him where I live. So here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the business behind business analysis looks like we had a little uh, font thing going on here. I'll tell you what those squares are. Uh, despite increasing uh, functional competencies within the BA community, I think 2012, that's what those funny looking characters are supposed to be. So if you're taking notes, 2012 will mark a year where business analysts will have to add to their competency toolkit, their ability to demonstrate uh, business leadership by articulating business value and impact uh, to the organization as a whole. And, and the truth is there's a couple of things that are sewn into uh, the thought behind the slide. Uh, first and for foremost, metrics, 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 and measurements. And I, I've been a big preacher of this over the years, and I, I think it's becoming an increasingly more critical that business analysts demonstrate quantitatively the value of that which uh, we are producing in the context of business analysis practices. So where are we through our activities um, increasing our return on investment? Where are we increasing uh, efficiencies? Where are we improving the means by which we're procuring goods and services? And is that quality through requirements management practices in fact increasing as, as we're doing what we're doing? So that's the first thing. The second thing is uh, the, the business skills part of it. One of the things I hear an awful lot from uh, the business analyst community out there is the challenge that they have uh, to sit um, at, at the conference table with senior executive leaders and pontificate strategies about 
uh, the next fiscal year. Where are we going? What are we doing? What sort of insights do the, the, the senior BAs have? And how can we guide the future? And I think you know, the profession still needs to grow. I think the acknowledgement still needs to be there. But I also think one of the missing pieces is uh, what I would you know, sort of largely brand as ownership and accountability. We need to get into, in the faces of our executive management team using a variety of businesses. Which ones do I need? Um, it could be anything from talking, uh, you know, return on investment, talking uh, the creation of efficiencies, talking about strategic plans, um, and being able to articulate it, being able to present that information which is relevant and important to a senior executive audience. I'm not suggesting that we don't, but I'm suggesting that we need to really fine tune this. You know, I just finished this week reading a book called The Four Essentials of Entrepreneurial Thinking. And um, I strongly recommend that brand new business analysts or semi-seasoned business analysts pick this, this book up. And, and what this book is really about is all the things that we didn't get to learn in school. Things like critical thinking and problem solving, change management, things like integrity, things like uh, uh, setting goals and objectives. Really great read that talks about the soft skills, the business skills that will help propel us forward and be uh, and, and be able to bark with the big dog and be, be able to sit at the table and, and strategize as business analysts and look at current state and help sort of provide insight into the desired future state. And I think some of this polish um, is some of the things that we should be seeking as sort of the holy grail. We're, we're technically sound now, and now we just put the finishing touches on the polish we should be doing very well at the executive level. And what was that book called again? It's called The Four Essentials of Entrepreneurial Thinking, The Things That We Didn't Learn in School. Cliff Michaels, that's the author. C-L-I-F-F Michaels. Cliff Michaels. So I talked about, uh, talked about this uh, uh, trend number six a little bit on the previous slide, and, and that is quantification of the value of business analysis. And um, I really mean this. We've got to put our money where our model is. Um, not just our mouth, but our, our model. And this goes back to the 3D thing again. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll put it out there. What, what, would, what would life be like if we could uh, seek out our requirements in a three-dimensional format and actually see and visualize with our stakeholders 3D bottlenecks uh, in, in processes and how business rules demonstrate traceability uh, with other business rules? What would that look like? Um, and, and would we be able to see the value of modeling um, instead of text-based, instead of uh, writing things down. So I think one of the things we have to really focus on in 2012 is the practice of modeling. And, and I'm going to guess when we, when we crack open the next polling question, I'm going to guess that uh, it's, it's a lot more, people say they're doing modeling and we're, we're creating these little Visio diagrams, but to what extent uh, it, it, I would be really curious to do. So, so Adrian, let's open up the next polling question and ask. Um, let's just get this out there. Is modeling, and listen carefully to the question, is modeling a mandatory practice for your requirements management development activities? So is it required for you to procure models as part of your requirements uh, or business analysis practices? Let's see what the audience says. The key word is mandatory. What do you think, Ben? Hmm. Um, nope. I think, I th well, I think that they should, but I think the reality is is that they don't. I would agree with you. I'm going to go, ah, this is a tough one. I'm going to say 60-40 yeah. again. Mm, actually, gonna... you know what? Yes is 24% and no is 76. Uh, so <sighs> I win this wow. time. Yes. <laughs> But um, I, I'm sad that you win. I, I'm very sad that uh, the numbers are, are as they are. And uh, some people perhaps might argue that modeling is, is, is very much time consuming. Um, I would argue the other way. I would say modeling is actually much, much faster. It's a lot easier for me as a business analyst to sketch out things on a whiteboard or to sketch out things on a ThinkPad um, or a, uh, not a ThinkPad, an iPad. And, and share them with, a, with our customers. So, you know, a picture is worth a, a, a thousand written words. And so it, it really strikes me as odd that these practices are not mandatory, even if it's a hybrid of practices. I mean, gosh, we, we got to be modeling. I mean, I look at things, uh, you know, in the UML language, and I look at uh, uh, an activity diagram, or, or rather a state machine diagram, where we can uh, 
quickly and easily identify where bottlenecks are occurring or how we can increase efficiencies by moving uh, data and pro processes through a system faster. So I'm, I'm really surprised. I'm almost a little bit sad now. Um, so now that I'm sad, let's, let's jump to the next slide. Uh, trend number seven, ladies and gentlemen, um, and this is um, COE's uh, uh, business analysis uh, centers of excellence provide a framework uh, for discipline. And, uh, you know, increasingly we're starting to see centers of excellence pop up. And this is a really funny trend in that I've been writing about it for years. I remember the first four years ago I wrote about COEs. I said, COEs are on the rise. And then they then we got into uh, economic crisis and COE, COEs were on the downturn and we saw community of practices. And that hung on for a year, a year and a half, and, and now we're back to COEs again. And it's interesting, um, we're starting to see business analysis centers of excellence manifest themselves both in the public sector and in the private sector. And um, even more interesting enough, you may find this interesting, that um, the, the most mature business analysis centers of excellence that I have seen and have the privilege and honor of, of witnessing and working with are those from India. And when you think about India, we think immediately business uh, outsourcing and outsourcing solutions. And um, a lot of organizations that I work with, some of the big ones are, are divided uh, by industry verticals. And each vertical within an organization has a business analysis center of excellence. What I find even more interesting is that sitting on top of all the industry verticals are enterprise business analysis centers of excellence. I don't think in North America we're quite yet at the enterprise analysis business uh, centers of excellence, but you know, in some state local government uh, agencies that I work with, COEs are, are beginning to manifest themselves. And a lot of you know, larger pharmaceutical type organizations, a lot of manufacturing organizations, we're starting to see BA centers of excellence show up. And I think the primary reason, well, the, all the other reasons that I've talked about just recently, talked about uh, modeling practices. I've talked about uh, the need and desire for improving efficiencies. We're starting to understand that the order of magnitude to bring this discipline together is a lot bigger than you know, grab, grab your pitchforks, donkey, and, and here we go. I think this is it's beginning really to start to take shape, and, and PMOs and IT uh, organizations say, this is, this is real. We need a, a forum. We need a structured and organized approach to understanding um, how this is done. We've seen this manifest itself through a lot of engagement happening, you know, with, with ESI and our competitors where we're starting to evaluate business analysis practices and some of the output of those practices is to create a center of excellence, a central stomping ground where all BAs can, can grow and mature their profession, mm -hmm. um, increase awareness, um, and have sort of a, a central stopping point with access to tools and information about competency development frameworks, methods. Um, we're seeing it happen an awful lot. Beware, however, uh, a center of excellence is not uh, a SharePoint portal uh, and a dumping ground for all kinds of information. I, when I talk about center of excellence, I'm looking at you know, an owner. I'm looking at a director level type of individual leading a center of excellence. We're looking about establishing standards and practices in collaboration with other disciplines within an organization. Uh, including software development and quality assurance and project management, um, supply chain, whatever your, however your organization is built up. Uh, we're looking at um, a, a strategic type of organization, again, giving rise and opportunity to business analysts who, when they grow up, are the strategic analysts within an organization. So it, it's becoming very strongly pre prevalent, not just in North America, not just in India. I'm seeing it happen in Europe. I'm seeing it happen in India, I've already mentioned India, uh, Japan, Australia, um, all over the world we're starting to see COEs and I think this is the, the year 2012 where we'll see um, them really, really um, uh, come to life. And so let's just see if that prediction or if, if we're tracking for that and let's uh, poll for some answers. Um, does your organization have a business analysis center of excellence, a community of practice? or some sort of centralized resources, resource that business analysts can use to help them with day-to-day -day activities. What do you think, Ben? Um, geez, I don't know. Let's, <laughs> they, most people are probably currently working on developing it. Um, I'm thinking that it's, it's new enough that, that people, well, not necessarily new enough, but new enough in, in North America that uh, people are still trying to you know, feel it out and figure out if it would fit with their organization. 
Right. I'm going to say we're going to see a high majority. I say I say 70 30. That's my guess. Well, I'm, going, I'm flying blind here. Well, we got uh, yes at 25 percent, no at 58, and currently working is 17 percent. good. Sorry about that. Hit the wrong button and I muted myself. So yes is 25%, no is 58%, and 17% is currently working on it. That's that's great. So I mean that's a good affirmation that, that we're, we're starting to see or show some signs of the rise of the Business Analysis Center of Excellence. And I think this is a great opportunity for business analysts just to sort of rejoice and say we're making <clears> progress <throat> in, our, in our profession. So this is, this is phenomenal. While I have a couple of minutes here, I think I'm a little bit ahead of time, um, I'm going to scroll through the list. Uh, Vinette Kane asked a question. And, uh, Vinette, Vinette, uh, Vinette, Vinette, I think it's Vinette. We'll go with Vinette. Um, in the agile environment, the requirements keep on updating. So should we keep the BR? Uh, so should the BRD uh, uh, be kept on updating? Well, uh, gee whiz, this is a double-edged question. This is a this is a tricky question, and um, I'm going to go with my gut on this one, Vinette. I'm going to say that if you're in an agile environment, uh, I'm not really certain why you would have a BRD. There are, there are no BRD practices uh, that I know of uh, that are practiced in the context of Scrum or Kanban. The idea is to reduce the amount of uh, documentation um, through the use of user stories and evaluate them in a product backlog. So uh, that's where I'm going with that. If anybody else wants to toss their hat into that ring, uh, certainly uh, welcome to throw an answer uh, out at Benit and share some of your own personal experiences. Uh, Allison asks, do you find that Agile and other practices will eventually make the waterfall method obsolete? Gosh, I hope so, Allison. I, I think uh, we're trending towards that. Um, I think some of the larger uh, government type entities will hang on to the waterfall practices for some time. Um, geez, if I had to make a guess, and this is really just a hypothesis, I would say five years at a minimum before we start to see signs of the waterfall environment in government agencies um, start to, to peter out uh, in the corporate world and in the, in the uh, private world, um, I, I, I think it's, it's going to come faster than we know, right? Uh, we got the BA with programming background, get absorbed in development in my experience. Okay, can you post a link on uh, Ambisoft? Robert, I think we got to that Ambisoft stuff. Look at all that. Look at you guys hungry for resources. Okay. Number of companies represented in the poll, roughly. Uh, Laurel, unfortunately, I don't remember which question. Are you? I think you might be referring to the government agency poll that we talked about. Um, I think that was. Uh, oh goodness gracious, that was 12 to 15 or so agencies that we worked with. And if that's not the case, I apologize. Uh, there's a PMBA book. Somebody advertising the book. Thanks, Rob. Um, Oh, I, he was putting the link to the uh, book, uh, The Four Essentials. Rob, perfect. Thank you. Um, got through all of that. And I think we're good to go here. So we're going to jump on to the next slide. Thanks, everybody. Keep the great questions coming. Oh, as a trend, is the PM or the BA at the same hierarchy level? Oh, Vinit, uh, great question. Um, gosh, I, the way Agile and Scrum is going these days, I think one of their biggest uh, hurdles is going to be hierarchy, and so I, I, gosh, I'll be honest, I don't like this question, then, because there is a lot of hierarchy that goes on in organizations, and I think in order for us to fully implement and uh, adopt agile, the agile framework and scrum methods or some other type of methods, we, we have to get rid of this hierarchy. Um, I'm okay with titles. Hierarchy, however, uh, will, gets us into a little bit of trouble, I think. So, um, PM and BAs, I would... Uh, say project managers and business analysts are peers and must be peers uh, within an organization, no different than software developers and quality assurance folks. So there you go. All right, I'm going to jump to the next slide. Um, I promise I'm going to do my best. Uh, so Dennis, Vanit, uh, ECG Studio, um, I'm going to uh, get to your questions as soon as I can. I just want to get to uh, some of the other slides here. Uh, BPOs, uh, business uh, outsourcing folks, uh, invest in the development of their business analyst practices. You know, really interesting to note uh, that if you look at some of the major outsourcing companies that sit, whether they're in Brazil, whether they're in India, or wherever they might be, um, I hear the Ukraine is now growing some, some great outsourcing practices. 
what I'm starting to see happen, and a lot of the, our customers, a lot of these outsourced vendors are really ramping up the business analyst uh, profession. And not so long ago, I want to say late last year, I worked with one of those larger organizations where we developed a program, an onboarding program, to bring to recruit business analysts in, number one, to develop competency, number two, to train them up, number three, and to uh, build marketing materials to present to their customers about the value of business analysis as a practice, as an add-on service to the services that they were already offering. And this company that I speak of will, will remain unnamed, but their competitors are doing just the same thing. And so what the reason it's happening, sadly, the reason that it's happening is that these outsourced vendors are seeing some of the turmoil that's going on inside of organizations where requirements and project management and quality insurance are so this big mixing bowl of activity and stuff coming out, but we're never really certain what, what the quality of that stuff is coming out. And so in, inevitably what happens is we're turning to our vendors and asking them to develop software for us when we are challenged with identifying the requirements to help them develop software. And so what's happening is service level agreements that are put into place with these outsourced vendors are being blown out of the budgetary waters, so to speak. So an outsourced vendor might come in, and I'm using rough order of magnitude here. Outsourced vendor would come in and say, okay, it's a million dollars a year for us to uh, do all your software development, support all your systems. And over the course of that year, extra workload and extra documentation and extra help desk, you know, escalation change requests all come in, add to the overall cost. And so in order to reduce them, so to speak, we are offering, or outsource vendors are offering this opportunity to say, hey, listen, we recognize that your business analysis practices aren't quite up to speed, and you're struggling with them, so we'll provide that as a service um, uh, for you so that we can help the requirements management process and the delivery of goods and services move along a little bit faster. So we're starting to see this happen an awful lot. I'm starting to see it. If you just sniff around some of the LinkedIn groups that are out there, and you sniff around at, at what's happening, you look at certification uh, of the IIBA, the CCBA certification is on the rise, CBAP certification is on the rise, particularly in India. Uh, the number of training companies in India are on the rise, the number of uh, uh, software solutions for requirements uh, coming out of India and in India are also on the rise. So there's a huge trend, I think, to watch for where we're going to see um, a large influx of onshoring of business analysis uh, resources. Here's a good question that just came in. Uh, Vicki uh, asked a question. Uh, Vicki says, do you see a risk in development providers providing BA services with the interest of the vendor, not the client, being served by results? Vicki, I mean, this is the $64 million question um, that I really think has 64 million answers to it. Uh, but if I had to uh, give you my own thoughts and opinions on it, is there risk? Sure there's risk. And, and the most arguable risk is they don't know our business. Um, that's the first one. Um, but uh, that would be a con. The pro might be we can float in somebody who knows the industry, and this is how the outsource vendors are going to pitch it. We know the industry. We've been in the industry long enough. We're going to fly them in, float them into your organization. We're going to have them facilitate requirements management workshops. You're going to provide the requirement. We'll put them in a structured format and approach so that when our development team receives them, we're moving a little bit more faster and a little bit more efficiently. So that's the way I see uh, things trending. Okay. Look at the questions coming through. I'm going to stop for a second and see if I can ding off a couple of questions because they are phenomenal. I can tell by the size of them. Uh, there's a comment by Cheryl, and I appreciate it. Cheryl, thank you so much. It's uh, just a comment. I disagree with the BAs having uh, having to have software development experience. I do believe that a BA should have excellent facilitation, presentation, and analysis skills. I've experienced that uh, uh, developers moving into a BA role tend to solutionize rather than determine the actual requirements. I don't think anybody's disagreeing with you, Cheryl. I said earlier that uh, you know the more knowledge, the more experience, the better. Um, I did say in my comments uh, that uh, there are some risks and pros and cons, and, and one of those risks, just as you said, uh, is that uh, you know a solution or a software developer will tend have a tendency to solutionize before anything else. Couldn't agree with you more on your statement. So thank you for your contribution. Appreciate it. 
and Agnes uh, agrees with us uh, in your statement as well. Um, is the BA course like CBAP Essentials to be a successful uh, BA? Uh, don't know how to quite answer that question. If somebody wants to throw their hat in the ring on that, is the BA course like CBAP Essentials? Uh, you sh I, I, perhaps you could phrase that a, a little differently. I might be able to get to that. What is the typical career path of a BA, uh, Mohammed, uh, Mohand? Um, a lot of different options. You know, they're all different. Um, not sure that it ties right in with the trends thing, but in my experience, we see BAs grow up as subject matter experts on the business side of the house, or they grow up as um, sort of help test IT subject matter experts on the information technology side of the house, um, and graduate from there, given that they have demonstrated a high degree of um, expertise and perhaps even some facilitation skills. Again, some risks in that. Um, I am starting to see um, business analysts emerge um, from colleges, believe it or not. I met uh, a group of uh, individuals not too long ago who said, we grew up wanting to be business analysts. And we studied some of this in college. And here we are. We're ready to hit that career. So very interesting to the note there. Uh, what about the business analysts being offshore? How is the trend there? Uh, Vineet, uh, the business analyst being offshore is a little bit difficult. I have seen it. I can't say that I, I have seen any great successes. I think uh, BAs being offshore is a, is a dangerous thing. I think it's really imperative that if uh, you know outsourced vendors are going to offer this, that BA should be on the ground working with customers. The only other sort of variance to that I've seen is BAs, uh, you know, hopping back and forth uh, between uh, motherland and customer um, for you know two, three, four week engagements at a time and, and jumping back from one place to the other. I think organizations are going to find out really, really quickly, given the economic times that. The, uh, the viability and the cost of that type of hopping back and forth is going to cost them in the long run, so to speak. So onshoring is, gonna, is probably going to be very, very prevalent, uh, potentially. That, that's the trend that I'm suggesting. Yeah, we should probably review this question. And then uh, Agatha is saying the problem is they do not understand the environment, and that's the danger of outsourcing. It absolutely is, um, although uh, they would argue that. So we'll see what happens. Agnes, I, uh, Agatha, I'm, I, I'm sorry, but that's what I'm seeing. Do you think the quality of work would be the same if the BA role is outsourced? Do I think the quality of work is, is going to be the same? I don't know. I can't predict that. Um, I would like to say yes. I would like to say it's going to be tentative. It's going to be shaky. Um, I would like to say they're going to. we're going to probably hear more about um, uh, disasters than we are going to hear about successes, which is typical of any environment. Uh, recall many, many years ago when outsourcing was really, really began to, beginning to grow, we heard all kinds of stories about how it was horrible and hideous and nobody knew and spending money and, you know, it seemed to settle down and there's a lot of very successful um, uh, organizations operating in an outsource model. So I think it'll be rocky to begin with and it'll probably uh, manifest itself as, as, a, as not a bad option. Are there BA courses from Tim? Uh, who has left that are tailored for specific industries. Um, none that I know of at this point in time, Tim. Good question. Just keeping an eye on time. Um, I'm a new BA and surely want to know what I need to focus more on as I involve in this role. Sheba, thank you for that. Um, there's a lot of great resources. Start with www.ciiba.org. Great resources. Uh, Susan Griffin talks about courses are never essential. Having facilitation skills, listening skills, and general analysis skills are relevant. Use, utilizing tools uh, is essential. Classes and certifications are helpful, but business experience is much more critical. Agree with you. Uh, one thing I would challenge you on is the tool side of things. Um, Susan, I would say uh, chalk and crayon is a really good tool, and I, I rely on those. Uh, and paper and, and whiteboards rely on those more than any other tool or software tool I have at my uh, exposure. Jack asks, what should the BA role be in the initiation of projects to evaluate, acquire, or implement uh, upgrade business systems? What should the BA role be in the initiation of projects? Jack, I would say, you know, maybe at the enterprise level, looking at, uh, uh, you know, business rules, business processes, uh, looking at how the business functions and interacts with other business units, units um, understanding current state, understanding, um, again, very simply stated, and I know it's very complex, and I dilute that, but um, looking at the organization and how it functions and all of the interactions and relationships that goes on is not a bad starting point. A big question that we could probably talk for hours about. All right, I'm going to jump to the next slide. I like this slide uh, because 
you know, everywhere we turn, there's a tablet. Um, it's an iPad. It's a, it's a, it's a BlackBerry Playbook. It's a, a Galaxy Tab. Whatever it is, they're everywhere. And um, I go back to my 3D. I go back to modeling. I go back to business rules and processes. I'm starting to see, I just had a demo done not too long ago. I'm going to another demo tomorrow uh, with, a, with a potential partner. But I'm starting to see um, applications manifest themselves in sort of a web-based environment. So we're starting to see requirements management tools um, show up an awful lot in sort of the cloud-based world, right? And what a great idea. And I challenge anybody out there, if you're not already doing so, to come up with a, an application uh, on an iPad or a BlackBerry Playbook that I could sit down with my customer and draw out a model using nothing but my finger, plugged into a projector and say, does it look like this? Is this the process you go through? Or even get my customer to draw the model for us. And we could tweak it, we could touch it, we could feel it, we can draw it out send it to a Dropbox or Evernote and have it access or Google Docs, whatever cloud-based type of environment you're working in, access the information and really create that collaborative environment. How cool would that be? I could be on the shop floor. I could be in a warehouse. I could be sketching this stuff out with Wi-Fi, with the whole nine yards. I have done a little bit of research and I have found a couple of business analysis applications out there. Some of them are absolutely cheese ball, but they're there and they're starting to show signs that there is value in the workplace. So you look at some of the technologies and you look at some of the applications that our organizations are using on the iPad, there is absolutely an opportunity for organizations to start thinking about requirements management apps on an iPad, a playbook, whatever your tablet of choice is. I think if we're not doing it, we should be doing it. It would make an analyst's life a lot easier. It would make our customers' lives a lot easier. And quite frankly, I think it would foster a higher degree of collaboration. So not a bad idea. If you're out there and you're thinking about it and you're doing it, let me know. I'd love to see what it looks like. I'd love to help you pilot test it. And last but not, oh, let's do a, a polling. Let's poll for some answers. Would you use a tablet to help you document, model, or validate requirements with customers if given the opportunity? Your boss has said tomorrow you're getting a tablet. What do you think? Ben, I, is it a no-brainer? Um, it's, it's a no-brainer for me, but I, I'm a geek, and I have one on me at all points in time. But I suspect that a lot of BAs are geeks, too. So I would say that uh, it should be a yes, and, and you're right. Somebody should develop something. That's a pretty good little business that somebody should uh, hop onto there. And we have 93% say yes, 7% say no. So I guess we have a lot of geeks out there. No offense to anybody, though. <laughs> well, for those um, for the uh, for the folks, the seven percent that said no, um, just drop into what, what you're thinking when you say they no. Um, you know, go to the question box and, and just shoot it out to the audience to say, hey, this is my rationale. There might be some value in it, maybe something I hadn't thought of. But but thank you. That's the, that was the, always fun for me. Um, we got some other questions here. I'm just going to hop to the the last slide. And this is um, the last slide. Trend number ten. I got to tell you, last year I was at the uh, BBC conference, um, and um, I'm predicting this year that we're going to see some incredibly large numbers, if not double. And um, this is a Building Business Capabilities conference that the International Institute of Business Analysis hosts. And I got to tell you, I was there last year, and the, the hype and the spirit, the camaraderie, the camaraderie, the community, the quality of topics, and the quality of speakers, and the and the interaction and the networking was enormous. It was electric, like nothing I've ever seen before. And I got to tell you, folks, I don't work for either one of these folks. I'm not here to endorse. I'm not here to brand. I'm not here to encourage. This was just me as an independent little old guy checking stuff out. I did have a speaking uh, gig there. Um, but I, I, I was most impressed by the camaraderie, by the spirit, by the buzz, and the interaction of all this group of business analysts who converged from around the world. That was another thing that was incredibly impressive. We had people from Johannesburg, Africa, Brazil, um, all over Europe, Japan. I know I had some uh, some longtime customers and friends of mine come in from Tokyo. Um, it, it was enormous, uh, the, the, the buzz. And so if you're planning on going there, um, I'm planning on going there this year, I would encourage you to tweet and blog about it and see if this trend uh, rings true. And as and I believe that's the last. Uh,
we got a polling question, right? Yeah, um, I was just Go thinking ahead. with the with the tablets, uh, what's coming through is a lot of people want to have, one said they wanted a keyboard, the other person says is that they really like the whiteboard and that sort of big space to work on and stuff. And I, I agree partly with that, but I don't think anybody would be toting a smart board around with them while they're going to a shop floor, so... <laughs> Yeah, and that's, those are just other areas of comfort and interaction. So it, it's very interesting. Thank you for, for feeding that back. No problem. Okay, so here's a, here's a polling question. Are you going to the IIBA's BBC conference? I'm just curious. What the, what, what's going on? Uh, well, for myself, uh, I can't, and I'm not a business analyst. I'm a geek behind the business analyst. So uh, let's see what everybody else says here. And we have 7% are saying yes and 93% are saying no. Ah, interesting. Interesting. Okay. I'm sure those numbers may, may go up. We'll see. Who knows? Well, if, if you're there, drop by, say hello. Love to meet you. Um, if not, um, I, I look for tweets. Look for activities and actions. They, they did a great job on the whole tweeting thing. So. Well, people are wondering where it is this year. Uh, at least there's a couple of people who have asked that question. So. In places last year, uh, Miami. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Great, great venue. Lots of fun. Okay, let's see if we can go through here, uh, Ben, and find some questions. There's a lot of comments. I don't think the CBAP is essential. Been a BA for 20 years. That's from Randy. Can you please repeat the website, please? I'm not sure which website, uh, Ambisoft, A-M-B-I, that, that was no, the website they, you mentioned. Oh, that, I, I, yeah, they were looking for I, IBA, I, and I put that out as a, as a link for everybody to click on, so hopefully they saw that in uh, the timeline. Uh, comment from Carolyn, if anything, I think a BA consultant or one that has been outsourced can maybe bring their experience and expertise to a client site, which would benefit the client going forward. I, Carolyn, I agree. I think, you, I think you're right. I think they bring a different level of objectivity. I mean, there's nothing quite like, uh, you know, an outside pair of eyes as a, you know, a practitioner of business analysis and somebody who's deployed in the client environment all the time. I think they're most appreciative of the fact that I'm coming in with a fresh set of eyes and I'm looking at things with almost a certain sense of naive, naive, naivety, not, you know what I mean, naivety, naive, whatever. Um, but I, I'm looking at it with a fresh set of eyes. So to, to some extent, there's a ton of value. Carolyn, I agree with you. Um, is solution development lifecycle a new standard in the BA world? I don't think so. I, this has been a terminology, Vanessa, that's been around for 100 plus years. I, uh, gosh, I've been in the business for 22 years. I know people have been in it longer. Um, solution development lifecycle has been around for a long, long, long time. I, in fact, I'm writing an article today that, uh, you know, going to challenge a solution development life. So can it be better? Can we make it better? Is there something more efficient? And some of you out there might uh, toss your hat in the ring and immediately say Scrum. There's our solution development life cycle, the new modern day version of it. So trend, BPMN or UML from Rob Harrington. Rob, great question. Uh, my answer to that trend is both. Uh, but, you know, we, we, here's the thing. Maybe I should just retract that lightly. Nobody's doing modeling. Uh, we saw that from the poll. Um, what do I think is going to gain a, a larger market share or be used more? I think it'll be BPMN. I think BPMN is largely focused on the business side of the house, where traditionally, before again everybody gets their hackles up, you know, UML was brought into the world stage as a software development modeling language, although we certainly see that um, ever present in non-IT, non-software related type of projects. So. They both carry their value. I think there's plenty of room in an organization for both of these modeling languages. I think we just have to acknowledge the fact that they look at things with different layers of abstraction. So, uh, but if you had to hold a gun to my head, Rob, I would say BPMN is, is probably going to take front and center stage uh, from a growth perspective. BA course, really? Okay, we're still on the BA course thing. Uh, what are the tools that are essential and mandatory for the success of any BA? Um, I would say the tools that are essential are, are experience. I would go with somebody else's comment earlier. I would say some of the other tools that are essential would be uh, critical thinking and problem solving. I would say uh, facilitation, uh, high impact interaction, which would replace the word communication, because I think there's a lot of collaboration that's required. Um, if you want to talk about actual tool tools, uh, modeling is, is a critical tool uh, or tool set that I would uh, uh, 
suggest you use. I'm not saying any particular vendor uh, specifically. I don't want to favor any particular vendor. There's a lot of great software tools out there. Um, I'm not saying use a business requirements document template, although if you don't have one and you're not in a Scrum type of environment, get one. It, it certainly helps put some structure and discipline and rigor around those requirements practices. So there's a lot of different things. Um, not a huge fan of, of being dependent Listen carefully. Not a huge fan of being dependent on tools. Um, I use them sparingly. I use them when appropriate, uh, but I do rely heavily on uh, facilitation and interaction skills uh, versus, you know, any spreadsheet. Let me just scroll through some more. We're doing good for time. We've got a couple more minutes to wrap up. Um, Kathy asked a question: Does this, does all this apply to a business systems analyst role? Well, Kathy. Um, a, a, a name by any other roads would smell just as sweet. I'm not sure what the context of your question is or the backdrop of business systems analyst, but if you want to look at it from a pure purity perspective, when I, I read the title business analyst, I think uh, uh, business rules, uh, policies, and procedures, and, and all of that sort of good stuff, when I think of the title business systems analyst, I think specifications. I think a finer amount of uh, granularity and detail. Um, however, I don't like doing that. I don't think we should hang our hats on titles. I think we should hang them on the wares of what we need, to, what our function is, and how we perform, what we need to contribute. Uh, AJ, I'm just reading through randomly here. Is it going to help the BA to acquire BPM skills where they can model and develop a solution and get business users in? 100%, AJ. Get get these skills. Absolutely. The more skills you can get, the better off you are. BPM. No question. Go get them. Uh, what was the reference for beginner BAs? He talked too fast for me to catch it. Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Hendrick. Uh, the reference for beginner BAs, www.theiiba.org. Angelique offers up Think Space as another tool. There's all kinds of free people offering. This is great networking, great community. Look at all the different tools that are coming through. Okay, just ripping through here. Agnes is saying tools are the most important, though. Agnes, I'd like to see your rationale for that. Are you familiar with Contour by Jamis Software? Rob, heard of them? Yep. Rob, I think I know you from somewhere. I want a full keyboard for the iPad. There's some. There's the iPad stuff, Ben, that you spoke of. Got the Miami question for the BBC conference. Connie, you, thank you so much. I know you've left. Vicky, sorry, I, if I could get you some budget, I would. Vicky, that's a bad question. Are you going to the conference? Hard to go conferences with uh, the new normal. I, I know, Alex. Sorry, buddy. I'm from the, the UK. Gosh, that would be great. I could make a, a holiday out of it, uh, Corny. Thanks for your presentation. The IT role came into the picture years ago. Okay, Reza, uh, years ago when development had an outsourcing close to 80%. The reason for the role is to provide requirements gathering and handoff of documented development, te develop technical architecture, document to offshore, just a comment. Thank you very much. I appreciate the comment. How do you differentiate between the business analyst and the geek behind the business analyst? We are currently using the term IT analyst, uh, but it seems generic. Is it common for BAs to report into an IT organization? A couple of questions there, Wendy. Um, you know, we all have an inner geek uh, in us, some way, somehow, somewhere. Um, again, don't get hung up on the title so much as I would get, uh, you know, more aligned with the function and what they are uh, producing. Um, as for should they report into the IT organization, I can tell you 50-50 split no matter where you go where you go in the world on how uh, BAs are distributed throughout companies and organizations. 50% are in IT, 50% are in business, and so on and so forth. There's also uh, you know the PMO where they sit as well, sprinkled and spattered throughout. So it's a tough question. I don't think that's ever going to change. Let's just grab one more question here, and then we'll tie it up right at the top of the hour here, if it's okay with you, Glenn. Any suggestions for models of BA and non-IT vehicles? This is uh, Prasanna. Uh, go
with a do a little bit of research present a quick Google uh, context diagram a great diagram you can also uh, you know use case models or uh, use case diagrams uh, are not uh, necessarily primarily focused on uh, IT uh, swim lane diagrams flow charts uh, data flow diagrams they don't all necessarily have to point their fingers at IT Cool. Well, thank you, Glenn, for a very informative presentation. Thank you, everyone, for attending today's Modern Analyst webinar. wanted to point out the webinar, along with the slides, will be archived at themodernanalyst.com within a few days. And this concludes today's event. And again, thank you a lot, Glenn. It was truly uh, one of the best presentations I've seen so far. So. Oh, thanks, Ben. No problem. Hope you all have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Bye for now.